thank you very much for the uh, introduction and also thank you very much for the invitation. So I, I've been interacting for some time with a lot of people in here online, but it's very nice to be finally here to meet them, all of them in person and to, yeah, to do some networking. So um, this, this speech will be focused mostly on me, how I'm using Nomad and Nomad Oasis because I'm still a postdoc. I'm quite like, uh, I don't have, uh, sorry, I don't have my research group yet. So I'm still like moving around different departments, trying to learn things. And uh, on, on this way, I somehow started using Nomad and I also started to contribute to Nomad at some point. And also along the way, I uh, deployed two Nomad Oasis installations in Aachen and in Brno. So uh, this user experience is, is, is what I will be talking about, but I also couldn't resist. <laughs> All right. Uh, I also couldn't resist to include some of my, uh, let's say, scientific work in that. So it will be like 50-50, the scientific part, and then uh, the nomad, like developer, external developer experience, let's say. All right. So why is it actually? Ah, OK, perfect. Um, I will be talking about the initial guided quantification of titanium vacancies in titanium oxonitrite thin films using the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And um, I, lot with, I work with a lot of experimentalists and they are doing thin films using PVD techniques like magnetron sputtering. And in such, uh, they very often end with some point defects in their films and the quantification is very difficult. Um, like um, yeah, mostly you can get just some indirect estimates from the lattice parameter or, or the composition from the stoichiometry and so on. Uh, and we were thinking maybe we can do a bit better because the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy is the technique that you usually use to quantify your bonding environment of, of, of the atoms, like the oxidation state and so on. And if, if, if you think about it, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, like here, titanium nitride and this marked nitrogen atom. So if you start adding vacancies, removing titanium atoms, this is like a big change of the, of the local environment. And one of the material classes that we were working with it is sodium chloride type oxynitrites, uh, which are like uh, better than the nitrites sometimes because they have uh, better high temperature stability and they inherently have a lot of vacancies. That's because when you start replacing nitrogen, which is usually three minus with the oxygen, that's two minus, you need the metal vacancies to stabilize the structure. Uh, so in some very simple approximation, for every three oxygen atoms in our structure, you have like one mental vacancy. And so we took titanium oxynitride as the simplest system and we were thinking, okay, let's see if we can see something with the XPS. And uh, I did some calculations. It was pretty much standard DFT with the GGAPB functional. And we created some structures with the vacancies. And then I calculated the binding energy shifts of the nitrogen 1S level. Uh, using the all electron win to k code uh, with the core, core hole approach. Uh, in that you calculate the ground state as usual and then you remove one electron from one specific atom, specific core level, you put it at the thermal level and then you do the, uh, you get the new energy of this, of this final state and then your binding energy uh, of the core level is really just the difference between those two. And this is quite crude approach so you don't get like uh, correct absolute binding energies or uh, like stuff that you have in spectra like the satellites, but you still can get a relative uh, precise relative binding energy shifts. And you do this for all atoms, let's say for nitrogen atom, all nitrogen atoms in the structure, and then you get energy histogram and from that you can get something resembling a spectra. And yeah, and because we are talking about nomads, so from the nomad perspective, uh, this is standard DFT calculations with VAST and win 2 k which are well supported at this point. Uh, but actually for the core hole, there's currently no concept of the core hole in the, in the Nomad meta info. So if you would upload this, uh, you would end with what would be looking like a lot of same calculations in the Nomad because uh, yeah, the input would be the same and the core hole would not be recognized and then you just end with different uh, energies and, and so on. Anyway, uh, now to the results. 
So if when we did this calculation and then we divided really the binding energies according to the local environments like nitrogen with six neighbors, five neighbors and four neighbors, it was immediately clear that there's a, a energy shift and quite significant of something like 0.5 EV per vacancy in the vicinity. And this is actually not dependent on the composition, but it's really consistent all over the uh, composition scale with respect to the oxygen content. And then uh, uh, we did also some fin films and measured the XPX spectra as well. And again, we, we were able to observe this free peak structure experimentally. And from the fits, the shifts that we saw were pretty much exactly the same what was predicted in the calculation. So this was the sign that what we are looking at is, should be really the same thing that, that we predicted. But to be even more sure, uh, when you actually plot the ratios of the peak areas of the three main peaks corresponding to the nitrogen with six, five, and four neighbors, uh, you get something like this. And now from, from simple combinatorics, uh, uh, yeah, if, if you have some vacancy concentration on the metal sublattice, and then you can, the probability of the nitrogen atom with zero, one, or two vacancy neighbors, you can get that really from the combinatorial numbers. And if you plot this as a function of the vacancies, you end with curves like this. And this is pretty much perfect agreement what, with what we see experimentally, except for this sort of uh, shift. Uh, and that's because uh, the films were exposed to the air and there's some additional oxidation uh, on top, which is unfortunately overlapping with the components that we got from, let's say, from the vacancies. But we made some few more approximations, were able to somehow correct for this offset. And then from the ratio of the three peaks, you can get directly the vacancy content uh, on the metal sublattice. And it's plotted here in the gold color. The red line is sort of the most stable scenario, the electroneutral model. And then we also try to make some crude quantification based on the lattice parameter changes or, or on the film stoichiometry. And in this case, it didn't end too well because the films actually have also interstitials uh, besides the vacancies. So uh, in this case, and those can't be distinguished from the vacancies in, in, from the stoichiometry or from the XRD. So in this regard, the XPS did like the best. Uh, Right, and this method, this app initial guided, uh, let's say quantification, uh, we were uh, also able to use it uh, for, for more, more material systems, for amorphous uh, mix, titanium di dioxide, silicon dioxide, thin films, we were able to distinguish oxygen in different environments, in silica, titania, and the mixed environments, and based on that, to quantify somehow the beginning of the phase separation, really on the atomic scales, on, on the scales which maybe you would see with the atom probe tomography or maybe not like really clusters of few atoms. And also, or another, another case uh, for polycarbonate interfaces, we were able to somehow uh, make some ad adhesion quantification for, with, different, with different materials. And uh, yeah, I don't have uh, time to really go into detail, but uh, yeah, feel, uh, I would be happy if you check the uh, manuscripts and. Of course, all of the DFT data is in the nomad. So, uh, uh, yeah, so to, to conclude this scientific part, uh, titanium vacancies in titanium oxonitride can be quantified by XPS. And uh, I hope that I maybe convince you that up initial calculations can be very, very helpful when you have some uh, XPS analysis and you need some help with quantification or with just understanding of what's going on in there. Right. And now let's get actually to the, to the NOMAD. So I first heard about NOMAD around 2017. Uh, I was using Win2K and on the Win2K mailing list, uh, Peter Blaha wrote about, about NOMAD. But at that time I actually used it and uh, it wasn't working, working too well. So I, and also I uh, was still early in my PhD so I didn't have a data problem. I still, uh, yeah, I still knew where all my data is and what I did and what I didn't do and, and so on. So uh, yeah, I, I just knew about that. And then I revisited actually in 2020 uh, because I was sort of thinking, okay, now I'm moving around Europe, different, different workplaces. 
and maybe it's not such a good idea to have all your data on one hard drive and then if you need something just try to search it and so on. So I tried again, uh, with, again with the VIN2K calculations from my, from my uh, thesis and it was better but maybe like 50% of the stuff was not parsed properly and, uh, and really working. Uh, but then I actually thought, okay, so, but um, I mean, in general, I like the nomad, I really like the concept, and I thought if this would be working better, this would be perfect for me, and I, I could really use this. So I took a look at the Win2K parser, and uh, even though I, I'm not a good Python programmer, I'm actually a very bad Python programmer, then I was able to uh, make some changes, and because the developers were very helpful, and uh, asked the questions and uh, helped me like to polish the code and so on. So I was able to get some changes upstreamed into the, uh, into the GitHub to the Win2K Pans parser. And with that, uh, yeah, uh, it was pretty much working for like maybe 95% of my PhD data. And I was very happy with, with the results. And also I was really very happy with the general workflow of the Nomad and uh, that uh, realize that okay, it's it's quite easy to actually get some patches accepted into the Nomad and to contribute and uh, yeah. So from that point on, I actually started to use Nomad for all of my publications. So uh, all the data, uh, the DFT calculations, I upload to Nomad, and then I check if everything is parsed fine. If not, I try to communicate with the developers or send some uh, fixes if possible. And uh, so just that everything is, uh, let's say, at least matched and detected and then it can be included into the, into the data set and then I get a DUI and put that into the manuscript. So that, that would be like, uh, yeah, really the standard way how to use Nomad. Uh, I'm also using the Nomad parser standalone, if, if, especially if you need some properties, extract some properties from the output files uh, different than the structure or forces. Uh, the, for that, probably you would use just the <coughs> ASE or PyMath gen. And uh, what I've been trying recently also is to, besides really just dumping the DFT calculations, just the, just the output files, uh, to somehow also include the workflows. Uh, like uh, if, if you have some graph with some property, then uh, usually this is not exactly what you calculate, but you need some steps in between. Uh, and so far I have success with the elastic or the uh, energy of states, like if you have an EV curve to really create the, the archive and insert this so, so that uh, like really the workflow from, from the DFT results from the run of the DFT software to the final properties that you show in the figure is 100% clear. And I mean, ideally I would do this for all the data. Uh, it's not there yet also uh, because I did not implement something for let's say my custom scripts, uh, but also maybe the metadata is lacking a bit that uh, not all the workflows that you can think of are really implemented in there. So. Uh, yeah, but um, I mean, that would be the ideal, ideal way. And obviously for, for the data that are not published yet or uh, that are maybe like will be published soon or will be published maybe some, sometime, I'm also using the Nomad Oasis. Uh, but I will, I will be speak about that, that more uh, at, at the next slice, right. And okay, yeah, so this slide is about the topic that was actually briefly touched previously during the discussion. Uh, so uh, I'm using for locally, I'm using Nomad Oasis all at, at my group. And then for, for the published results, it's always like the upstream Nomad. And this, this figure actually shows like this, 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 uh, uh, this line, but uh, unfortunately at the moment it actually doesn't work. So you get like a message like this that in the future versions of Nomad it will work, but uh, right now uh, it actually doesn't work. And uh, I hope that uh, this will be fixed. But also what I had, uh, um, one, one challenge that I was facing during the, the, my career is when I was using Nomad at one place, like in Aachen, and I, then I moved to Brno to another position, how to actually transfer my data from the Nomad Oasis to let's say new Nomad Oasis that I would, that I would uh, use in Brno. And uh, 
My solution to this was sort of big hammer because I was the administrator of the Oasis, so I just made like a complete duplicate, deleted uploads from all other persons than me, and then I used <laughs> this complete Oasis duplicate to run a new Oasis. But I'm kind of hoping that we can also have some system how to really transfer data between different Nomad Oasis installation, or maybe also some way how to search like the Nomad Oasis and the Central Nomad, because right now I keep everything in the Oasis, just I have, because uh, if I want to search everything and then I have something in Nomad and then maybe something in the Oasis, then I can do search like on all of the data uh, at the same time. Uh, all right. And now about the uh, specific Nomad Oasis installations. So the, uh, I, uh, when I was doing postdoc at Materials Chemistry at RWTH Aachen in the group of Professor Schneider, uh, so this was a group that was doing both theoretical and experimental, uh, experimental design of materials. And uh, yeah, the, the research data management in the group for the experimental results, it was sort of like uh, the standard Stone Age, I would say. So uh, the lab books, physical lab books, uh, some central storage of the, for the samples in some boxes, uh, and then the measurements on, on the PCs are like safe up automatically and so on. I mean, it's, it's very, uh, I think it's very reliable and so on. And they were also introducing some, some local research data management system from, from some local startup, but it was actually proprietary software. But for the up initial calculations, it was slightly worse because people are were managing them on their own, like leaving them on the cluster or personal PCs. And in few cases, I actually had to search for the old data. I couldn't find them. And then I had to contact the people that left some time ago. OK, do you have the data or not? And can I have it? And, and so on. And I thought, all right, uh, I was using Nomad, upstream Nomad at that point, and I was thinking, OK, this is open source. Maybe we can deploy it locally. And I did some Googling, and I actually found Nomad Oasis and realized, OK, this is a supported scenario. It's perfect. Let's see uh, if we can deploy it and if we can make it work. And surprisingly, it was very, very sim or not, not really super simple, but it was reasonably simple. And uh, for our, our purposes, it worked quite OK because most of the uh, group was doing VASP calculation that was pretty much supported very well from day one. Some Phonopy, Win2K, which I was doing, and that was already supported at that point. So we pretty much needed just two new parsers for the OpenMX, which is a DFT uh, with atomic basis set and plane base, and the group used that for uh, some large scale uh, up initial molecular dynamics, and then the Lobster, uh, which is sort of uh, bonding analysis on top of the plane wave, plane wave DFT. And I think in, in general, it was something like um, one month of work to get the Oasis running and uh, report some problems with the parsers uh, and maybe send some fixes and then to write the two parsers for, for, the, for the codes and make some, make some improvements. But I, I think in general, I, I was not too ambitious with this. Uh, let's say with this effort, the, the idea was just that when some people are leaving the group, like the PhDs or, or the postdocs, that there's a very simple way how to actually archive the data and that they don't have to invest too much time into actually, uh, yeah, into actually storing and archiving everything. And uh, in that regard, I think it was uh, quite a success because some PhD students that were leaving at the time were able to really like in two hours I mean, minus the parsing time to really dump all their calculations into the into the oasis and write some simple comments maybe and and check the metadata and so on. So, um, yeah, in that regard, it was uh, it was uh, I think like a big success and hopefully it's serving in the group even now for uh, for the research data management. But actually, yeah, I'm gone now, so I don't really know. But. Maybe one point that I want to uh, discuss at this point, so importance of uh, upstreaming. Uh, this was quite early yeah, uh, in, the, in the Nomad development, but uh, yeah, I, I, we wrote some, we wrote some custom, custom things for the Oasis and the parsers we were able to get upstreamed. So th that's perfect and they are still working. But we had also some custom normalizer and some different improvements to the Oasis 
and then also some parts for, for stuff that was actually not suitable for upstreaming because it was something really specific to the group. And uh, nothing of that is, I think, working today because at some point the Nomad is really moving very fast and, and it was changing a lot. And nowadays I think it's better with, with the plugins and so on, but this was like before the 1.0 version, it was just like 010 or something. And uh, yeah, at, at some point the maintenance burden was quite quite large. So I, I think uh, then just at some update, I, I just like uh, disabled or removed the patches and so on. So I, I think uh, nowadays it might be better, but still if you have some plugins for your Oasis or something that could be at least considered for upstream, I, I would suggest that like for all the other users, but also maybe for you to, to, send it, uh, to send it to the Nomad guys because and they are very helpful and uh, yeah, they are happy to, to upstream your changes if it actually makes sense. Right, and, and, and the last uh, topic, because uh, the time's running up, is uh, the last Oasis that I'm running now in my current, uh, current workplace uh, at the Masaryk University. And this is uh, Nomad Oasis. Um, the group is mostly experimental, so nowadays it's pretty much just a stock oasis which I'm using for my ab initio data, but there's some interest for, from the group about the experiment, so I hope that I get some insights tomorrow maybe also about the, about the experiments. But what's this oasis may be a bit special, that uh, I actually managed to run it in the, in the Kubernetes cluster. Because I started with just running it on my workstation, and that was obviously not perfect because like the scalability and uh, also you have to turn it off sometimes. And uh, yeah, and then I was uh, asking our IT if I can get like a virtual machine as I had in Aachen to, to run the Docker and they said no, but they actually offered, uh, offered me the Kubernetes cluster. And unfortunately at the moment it's uh, not really that well documented that there's some configuration file uh, that's used sort of for parts of the upstream Nomad, which also runs in the, uh, in the Kubernetes, at least parts of it. Uh, but I had some help from our IT department and I, we actually managed to make it running. And uh, yeah, my, my, uh, what, what I like most is really the scalability. Because usually the Oasis, as it runs, it uses pretty much no resources like just for the web page and the elastic search and so on. But then you still need to run it on something that's reasonably powerful when you send a big upload with a lot of data or you actually update the new version and then you hit reprocess on all of the, all of the data. And actually in this, the Kubernetes, which is sort of like this <laughs> operating system for, uh, for these uh, containers, it's, uh, it's really perfect and uh, I hope that maybe in the future, we can make this a supported, supported part of the Oasis setup and uh, with, with maybe a better example chart for, for Helm and, and so on. And yeah, with that, so it's actually running now <laughs> 40 days, so this is quite recent. Uh, some stuff is not that stable yet, so you can see some restarts of some services. And yeah, the Elasticsearch, I still run it on free. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's not everything is perfect yet, but it works, and I, I think uh, I really like it like it more than than the standard Docker Compose setup. So uh, maybe I can also sort of uh, influence you to try this and uh, uh, make this more uh, supported and more easy to deploy use case. All right, and with that, I would like to conclude my talk. Uh, at this point, Nomad works really work well for me. For the up initial data, it took some work, but uh, I really have huge uh, uh, appreciation for the Nomad developers and, and the community because there's good documentation, submitting patches and, and working with the developers is really, really easy. And also the Oasis is very helpful and quite reasonably easy to set up. And yes, yeah, stuff like writing the parser is also quite well documented and, and, and uh, yeah. So I would like, to thank again to all Nomad developers that helped me along the way, most particular Marcus and Alvin, who were really like answering a lot of my questions on, on the forums and uh, helping me with, with everything. And then I would also like to thank you for your attention.